Greetings and salutations. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from out in the metaverse. Welcome to episode 50 of the Metaverse Nomads podcast, where we talk about all things blockchain gaming related and happenings and developments throughout the metaverse. And we've got a guest with us today. Before we get to our guest, Ray, how you doing, man? I'm doing great in hot Florida right now. Just got here uh, a couple of days. I'll be back home in Puerto Rico. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to today's show. Good stuff, man. Fancy hat. How you doing? Yeah, equally hot over here. The Australians have stolen all the rain. <laughs> it's dry in the UK. That's unusual, huh? Darn those Australians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with us is uh, Lumina from Coexist, man. How you doing? Hey, guys. I'm good. How about yourself? Whoop, whoop. Doing well, man. Doing well. Here in the Amsterdam, Netherlands. Sun's shining. No. Good day. Nice. It's actually I've been I've been raining today in Istanbul for after really a few weeks. So it was sort of a refreshing today. But yep. Uh, nice. So what do we got? It's uh that's still uh, I think newsworthy. There's a few items we've got uh on deck here, but uh we've got just a little bit of uh news related to some of the uh the games that we cover. But uh where you want to jump in, fancy hat? Where where, where should we start? Uh, we could uh, take a look at Polonium. Uh, I think uh, could also look at yours. Cool. Uh, yeah. Let's we'll start with Polonium. I think that's a good place to start. That's a good one. Yeah. So this is a Web3 console that has uh, been talked about over the last few weeks. 4K Ultra HD scanner, ray tracing, up to 120 frames per second. And uh, yeah, anything to do with Web3, it's getting the appropriate amount of hate. Uh, it was quite interesting when they first put this up. It had the copyrighted name for Apple's like fingerprint scanning technology. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the website got taken down for a couple of days and that's good now. Interesting. I like the idea of a gaming console, Web3 gaming console, because as all of us, you know, as we know, as we're getting closer to playing Star Atlas, for instance, I'm dreading what that will look like for those of us that use a hardware wallet. You know, how many times are you going to have to be disrupted while you have to punch in a code? And then what even happens if uh, you can set these to 10 minutes, but that's the most. So what happens if you're playing along and something critical, an event happens where you need to approve a transaction and your hardware wallet timed out? You got to take the time to put in the code and get it back going again. So yeah, that is that is a a challenge that has yet to uh, the industry has yet to overcome, and so a console like this, the reason I think it is a a good concept, whether or not I trust it, that's a whole a whole other conversation. But let's say it was trustworthy and it was a hardware wallet or connected in a way that you could use your your uh, fingerprint because that's how this device works. But in that process you make it so that a traditional gamer doesn't have to change a lot in their behavior. They log on to their console, they get ready to play a game. When a transaction needs to occur, something can pop up in normal language that is not all crypto heavy, and they just put their thumb on top of the console device and the transaction's approved. Minimal adjustments to the behavior. So I can see things like this helping traditional gamers on board into the blockchain gaming space. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think it's the best way to go when it comes to anyone joining or ha or who have been in the space to just get rid of the, the middleman, which is anyone needing to, uh, instead of just playing games they want to play and just to have fun, uh, getting rid of all of the steps that you need, which like you were just saying with this hardware wallet and then MetaMask, hot wallets, cold wallets, and any of that stuff should be on the on the back end of things just working without you needing to learn about it. And you know, we'll get there and we see these types of developments where if you buy the console, all this will be in-house already uh, stocked right, right, for you to just sign up almost as easily as an email and password where there's still that security with your words being secured in a wallet. And if you did take the time, I guess they would walk you through a little tutorial, I, I believe. Uh, I think that would be the, the best way where there's a mini tutorial on what to do and what it means to have these keys. Um, and then if you were to lose your console, you bought another one, you would just be able to restore using those keys because you can't really get around not having your keys Right. in your own possession so uh, that, that would be another hurdle i guess for the industry to to conquer or as individuals to maybe get creative and think of ourselves 
to to help with this the securing of the 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 seed phrase. So now ultimately you are protected, knowing that no matter what console you buy, no matter what hardware X Y Z you get, uh, you're ultimately uh, in custody of all of your assets. Do you guys? And this this leads to an interesting question. Um, while we're still on this. Are there a known established best practices for seed phrase? And and by by the way, I mean if you have one that's unique to you and you want to keep that secret, by all means, don't give that up. But it's one of those things where I could see legacy gamers getting comfortable using this because they have to set it up once, um, then using their fingerprint on the scanner, as you see that this has here. There's a quick uh, access button for accessing your wallet. But this still leads to that issue of if you haven't properly managed your your keys uh, and to be able to restore if your if this device breaks, someone steals the device or whatever happens to it. Like, wh where do people go to figure out what best practices are for for storing that stuff? Like, what what are people being taught? I mean, I have ideas for how I do it myself, but I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on that. I could I could talk from my own experience where back in what even 2013 when i was just learning about these things but then really getting in financially myself in 2016 2015 16 uh the first thing i ever did was just learn about how to uh protect what i'm gonna essentially put it put in because what would be the point if you're just gonna lose it all in a week so uh the, the, it was very early on still and it, and i knew that and the underlying technology i was getting a grasp on as far as like what it could do to change the world that we're living in today so ultimately uh, yeah, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that I guess people ho have made already, but there's a pretty interesting one, which is like the the, bu the bulletproof vest of just securing your your seed phrases, having like these titanium plates. And there's mm -hmm. there was another company that created a cylinder type. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, I forget the name of it. I have it saved on my bookmark somewhere. I'm um, probably on my my other and computer letters that slide on that sleeve yep. right yep. yeah it, it's almost like a vault lock that you can turn mm -hmm. and then you save your seed phrase on it i forget what it was but uh it was the the most i guess uh, uh creative one out of the bunch but ultimately you can just get a, a metal or titanium or whatever metal i guess there's out there and you could hammer in and and etch it in there uh with a with a hammer and uh and a nail or whatever utensils they give you and then no matter if there's a fire or if, or if there's water or besides an earthquake and you losing it to the core of the earth and it falls through the cracks of the of the earth, I, th I think that would be the only way. But as long as it's uh, it, it won't deteriorate, you'd always have your seed phrase safe there. So that right. that's one great way to do it. And then there's methods to having that I've also learned of of having people join in on having uh, an ABC type of method with your seed phrase. Uh, there's a there's Nifty Island is a project that's being built out. It's a game social web you know Web three you know, metaverse. And I talked about it here. We had the, the co-founder on and uh, there's some, some companies are doing, doing this type of strategy as well, where they'll have the company having eight words out of 24 uh, just so you won't get wrecked as that new person coming in and then blaming it ultimately the game you first got involved with as like a pump and dump Ponzi, Ponzi scheme, where it's just like, you won't be allowed to, unless you go through and have the other, the other words uh, at your disposal uh, utilized. And uh, but yeah, you could also get someone that you care for or that, you know, um, won't like backstab you at some point in the future. And you can give them eight words. You give yourself eight words and then there's another eight words. And then even if your brain was uh, was taken advantage of in any way by aliens, I don't know, the, the most outrageous thing could possibly happen. They would only have eight words and the other the other words would be safe. Um, so if you died, essentially. Uh, th there would be a way that these other two individuals that you trust would be able to get a hold of your words. But, um, but yeah, th there's, there's a couple of ways, but the, the safety is just something we have to pay more attention to. And during these times right now with all of these major centralized lending protocols and, and uh, things are happening with your funds, not being yours, if, if it's not your keys, not your coins type of situation, this is a great, great time to get involved and dive deep into just educating yourselves because the space is going to be here. Prices are still low. So, better doing that now than, than than not interesting what are we looking at here we're looking at oh uh my mic was muted so before we move on uh one of the things i like about this is that uh there's a leaderboard everything compatible in like to one so it'd be really cool like 
seeing the different guilds on the top player list uh, and all the hmm. different names and uh, identities. And so that's basically a leaderboard of of guilds and individuals that are using this using the console. Um, it's like an achievement system for all the games in one. Oh, so, okay, I got it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, the way you get this is by buying a Polonium Pass with uh, their tokens, I believe, and you get like PFP and uh, staking rewards, launch events. Um, going the whole five miles but uh they're still in like the idea phase of the console so yeah so does anyone know who's backing them what they you know what they're behind because that's one of the things i mentioned uh before the show as we were talking about this is that you know trust is a big issue here when someone's stepping up to kind of be the people's champion and say look we're going to help you secure your wallet it's like but are you and like you know why should i trust you i mean obviously ledger has been around to a point where they've earned trust as some of the other uh, uh hardware and, and software wallet uh companies but uh yeah i'm just curious if they have any connections or we know you know who they're partnered with and all that sort of thing so yeah i haven't seen any big names like that that would be reassuring just seeing right. all, like the usual ones like anna monica brands and yeah yeah so uh there's also uh, another story i have and basically this is about uh reddit doing nfts but refusing to call them nfts <laughs> if you get the control yeah. f the search function out and type in nft the zero uh, if you type in collectibles 21 mentions <laughs> so yeah it looks like they're trying to like pivot away from that type of identity while still using like the core blockchain technology so it's on chain functions like an nft they're just avoiding the language because they've seen the backlash that other traditional like ubisoft and others when they're trying to to you know the, the backlash they got when they tried to introduce nfts to their communities is that kind of your take uh pretty much and uh i guess it'll be interesting to see how that turns out i know uh like cryptocurrency is quite active in reddit they have uh moons and that type of thing so could be a market for it yeah. it, it it makes me wonder. So you've got social networks, um, you've got all, all these com community-based platforms, and we know avatars are a big thing. So the question becomes, are they trying to stay relevant because they know people want to have PFPs to kind of represent their identity? Or do we think it's specifically that they're trying to figure out another revenue stream? Or is it a combination of both? Yeah, it seems like they're trying to get it more mainstream. Uh, just doing it without like, the connotations that have been attracted in the bear run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you want to take it away with your sections now. Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, just throughout the week, I kind of peruse uh, news articles and things that are related to blockchain gaming, to the metaverse. And so this week, I was just looking at some things that are blockchain gaming related. And I thought it was pretty interesting that uh, uh, the person that uh, heads up or headed up uh, uh, games for TikTok uh, left last month after two years with uh, the company and his exit uh, is to go to um, work for uh, another company that is going to be blockchain gaming based. So I thought that was pretty interesting uh, that we just see a lot of roads leading to blockchain gaming. And so you would also think that startups and companies that uh, are leery of blockchain gaming for its ties to crypto and the crypto market being down right now, uh, there's obviously enough interest where they recognize that the future of gaming is headed in this direction. So they're taking this time even throughout the bear market to gear up and get themselves ready. So I thought this was an interesting take for someone that obviously had had a pretty good run and uh, was set up quite nicely for their involvement with TikTok. Uh, yeah, so you see awesome. a lot. Yeah, you Go see ahead. a lot of people just making that move into into this into the Web three space, no matter the company name. You know, like you started with a uh, you, the head of gaming at YouTube. You know, uh, uh, Ryan Watts. He just hopped over and it seems to be like a, a no brainer with a lot of these, you see these names just starting to pop up more and more frequently now. And there's a lot of things that aren't being publicized in the mainstream media. So who knows what's been happening uh, other than these articles that we're pulling. Right. 
Yeah, it's all the same tech. It's just on a discount right now. Right. I thought this one was pretty interesting. I'd never even heard of them, but I guess there is a uh, new project called Oasis, but spelled O-A-S-Y-S, uh, that they just raised $20 million in their private token sale. Um, and so, you know, which is not, I mean, we've seen lots of companies be able to do that, you know, throughout the past year, but this one was interesting in that it's uh, got a lot of early validators and backers that are taking part in it uh, from Sega to uh, Ubisoft, as I just mentioned earlier, another player in the, in the gaming space that is trying to, to figure out how to establish itself, establish itself in the NFT and blockchain gaming space. Uh, and then also, uh, they mentioned a number, number of others, uh, South Koreans, video gaming companies, Netmarble, we made and, and come uh, to, uh, to us. And then in the same sentence, they also mentioned YGG, which I thought was pretty interest, uh, interesting that they're including them in that uh, same group of, of early uh, influential validators. Oh, yeah, the Oasis. And of course, their token uh, is uh, OAS. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's interesting too, the YGG thing. It's just the roots go deep with these institutions or these guilds or these companies, if you if I may, because of all of the development and relationships that were built along the way. So there's a lot of revolving door situations going on and then relationships that were cultivated for years on end before any mainstream media really got hip to what's going on or traditional companies. So yeah, yeah I'm not surprised. And YGG has trailblazed in their own right um, this whole model of guilds uh, to begin with, even though scholarships was what Axie Infinity did. It was just like a hand, hand helps hand or back, you know, <laughs> situation. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So Nat you asks here, do you think that uh, they see where the future is or do they just see the money that they can make before they've even made a product or both? I think it's in both camps. I think that every company out there that, it, for example, I'll give you a perfect example because this is kind of like part of my background. Um, in the early 2000s, I spent a lot of time in the early e-commerce digital marketing space, helping businesses to establish a brand online. That was an interesting transition for them. They knew that they had to have an online presence, otherwise they would no longer be able to compete. The same thing happened again uh, in the later part of uh, the early of 2000s, around 2008 to 2010, where businesses knew that they had to have a social media presence or they were missing out on the conversation that their target audience was having. And I think businesses are scrambling again as a whole, thinking in terms of what the metaverse and online virtual worlds will be and what does that mean to their brand. So in some instances, part of it is that, especially if they're a game company and they're seeing how all of this interest and money that's spilling over into uh, the blockchain gaming space, I think most of them realize that they need to figure out their role so that they can stay relevant. So that's one part of it. And of course, you always got people showing up in shareholder meetings and, you know, uh, in, in other meetings within a company saying, hey, here's an idea I have on how we can create a new stream of revenue. So I think it's a mix of both. Some it's greed based. Some they're just trying to stay relevant and stay alive. Yep. Yeah. Well put. Well. Yeah, it's just being relevant and adapting as you go, or else you become obsolete. <laughs> like it's Indeed. pretty that's it's that simple, I guess. But the challenge is is that like they're they're as we saw, we've seen we've seen so many examples within the past year of them doing it wrong because they're doing it for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. and they got so much pushback from from their communities because it was almost like a me too thing for them just to say, hey, look, we're gonna jump in this space. We really don't understand NFTs. Uh, so much so that I think that the best thing that the average company can do to participate in this space, if they're going to go the NFT route, is to just make an NFT like an OG NFT that is commemorative and free for the people that are the biggest contributors to their community. It's just a way of acknowledging them and appreciating them. People don't get upset over free stuff. It's only when there's an ulterior motive and ways that you're just trying to leverage new technology to make more money, even if it doesn't directly support your community. So yeah, I, I think we'll start to see more of that now that companies are starting to learn from the mistakes that those have, that those have made that have gone before them. Spot on. Um, uh, can I say something real quick about this? Um, yeah. um, this reminds me uh, which months ago when I heard the news about uh, Square Enix 
uh, was investing in NFTs and whatnot, especially with the Final Fantasy franchise and the other games that they're going to come out with. But unfortunately, this is sort of a negative news, unfortunately. A few days ago, they just said that they will no longer invest money mm. into NFTs. So that's, I think, is a really big loss because that's a really big company, especially t- talking about Japan. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> no worries, man. Yeah, but I, I agree. I think a lot of these companies, like Jess was saying, are jumping in, maybe not knowing enough themselves, but hiring out positions of people who are advisors or, or the like. And they, they're retracing now because the the whole the whole uh, arena of web3 and making money is changing so the marketing strategy right. has to change so you right, have right. to you have to backtrack and reverse engineer what you're doing and they might have missed the boat already you know like we've passed that last year and now everything is changing and being spun on its head uh, the technology is valid we all know this and we're preaching to the choir but it's just like these big companies and even bill gates there's an article that uh, pretty much it's just a headline here but bill uh uh yeah, uh, Bill Gates over here, he has a, uh, came out in the news, uh, just to quickly yeah, say, read the headline, this is Bill Gates says NFTs and crypto are 100% based on the greater fool theory. So no one is uh, is immune to this, even big companies, because I, I think we can get into that uh, and let, we could let just, just continue, but we can get into the greater fool conversation of how is is this the whole world is the whole world operating on a greater full theory and what every industry and market but yeah just just a little well, I mean, well you well you've got that up i mean i think it's probably a good segue into it like how how would you define that for those that aren't familiar with what this theory proposes sure so basically in finance the greater full theory suggests that i guess one can sometimes make money through the purchase of an overvalued asset So as long as there's someone else willing to pay more for the asset that you just acquired that you're selling at a at a at a higher markup because you want to make money, then there's someone out there. So uh, items with a purchase price drastically exceeding the intrinsic value. So I'm pulling some off of uh, online here as well, but it, it basically is that. So like someone is there someone out there always willing to pay more for what you bought at at a price that was lower. So. Um, but isn't that how all businesses make money? So I'm just throwing questions out there, um, rhetorical or not. And uh, and Bill Gates is one of these individuals who are just coming out, ultimately bashing, maybe in not understanding the complete um, the basis of what the technology is and how can it be applied, especially with him owning all the land that you can maybe elaborate on just as far as his background, just you know, acquiring and being an owner of. Yeah, uh, like, most of the farmland out in the in the in, on the planet, know, yeah, <laughs> on the whole planet. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I, I can't speak for anyone, but does Bill Gates understands how he could make more money with p- blockchain technology if that's what he's ultimately wanting to do? And what I don't know what his goals are in the space or in the world. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories and, st- and things that are being thrown around, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is what we've always been operating in since, you know, the days of when markets began and bartering, which is yeah. like, how much more can you get off of what you've already purchased or traded for? Yep. And I think another piece of that, too, and this is the same thing we've seen from Warren Buffett, uh, is where those who have amassed their fortunes that are so closely tied to fiat currency will use their influence to discourage things that threaten fiat currency and everything about nfts and blockchain and cryptocurrency are a threat to traditional finance and fiat currency so that's when i always consider the source when you have someone that's kind of poo-pooing things in the crypto Mm -hmm. space it's like where where do their interests lie right I think it's just hilarious that the longer you just stay in a, in a in a space where there's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot of lucrative opportunities, lucrative opportunities, and you just follow where the big money is, and it's complete opposite. Just as the mainstream media sometimes, or most of the times, are they they talk in in double speak, where it's just like what they're saying is what you should do the opposite of. Um, yeah. But ultimately, if you have enough time to stick around in this space, you'll see. And even if you go back some, you know, the heads of banks were saying, you know it's it's garbage and they'll fire employees i guess mm-hmm. jamie diamond from goldman's uh, from chase bank um and, and you'll just see how everyone is now not talking about that anymore or now supporting it uh from governments all the way down to just chipotle accepting bitcoin as payment to buy food right so it's just try not to just listen to any one source of news uh, definitely 
try to get out there and diversify just like you do with your money, uh, the information that you're consuming. So you can, I guess, not financial advice, make better financial decisions. <laughs> right. Agreed. Yeah. There was a number of things uh, suggested here from from those of you watching that are, that are spot on, like question, like are, are NFTs, do they not fall into that category? And I would say that they do, because the truth is so much that's happened in the blockchain gaming space and with NFTs has been Ponzi based. Uh, and, and, and essentially what that means is that the value that it holds is dependent upon new people coming in willing to spend more money. And the moment that that caps off, we see the project just drop like a rock because so much of this was tied to crypto. And on a number of our shows in the past, I've mentioned this, that if we look at the market as a whole, blockchain gaming, it is truly built on funny money. And here's what I mean by that. So you've got lots of people that did well in crypto. And a lot of a lot of young people as well, because young people tend to be more flexible in adopting of technology. So as you know, 2017, uh, you know, a lot of people made, made especially money in ETH and in Bitcoin. And when you have this money that is not sitting in your bank, you treat it a little bit differently. So then when games came along, people were like, wow, you mean I can make money gaming and I can buy assets that I own in these virtual worlds? It's appealing. And so all of a sudden we start buying up these things without really knowing their utility. This was the case definitely with Mirandas. Like we, we, it wasn't anywhere on the horizon, but yet they sold somewhere in the neighborhood of about $300 million worth of in-game assets for this game that's still in the early stages of development. Here's where things kind of get tricky with this potential, you know, uh, the fool's theory. The people that have bought these assets up to this point this is a small market, not a very small market, but it's still a small market of crypto savvy people that have made money in the space. So it's not like they pulled out their credit card to buy these things. Okay. If they had, it would have been a different market altogether. And so now that we have, we own these assets, but what we don't yet know, and also this last bull market created a feeding frenzy, which drove prices and value up. You know, the first homestead, what on, uh, for Moranis, I think it was like 50 bucks or something, maybe 150. It wasn't that it wasn't that much when it was first sold in their marketplace. But the prices uh, of re future releases on NFTs went up and up and up. Why? Because the developers realize that's what the market will bear. And so it inflated this price to such a degree that it's not a real proven economy because it doesn't involve the masses. So the question becomes, when the masses do come on board from the legacy gaming world, what will the market bear then? And will the developers realize, look, to bring all these people on, we really can't sell these high-priced NFTs anymore. And what will that do to our NFTs that we actually own that were bought during this time when there was a frenzy? That's Wapa. still unknown. Hopefully they maintain the utility we think they'll have. But truly, when the market starts to move this way, the market might say, look, we're not willing to pay you guys more than 100 bucks for an NFT for gaming. That's a real possibility in the future. Yeah, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, that's why it's it's important to take a step back when you're initially getting into the space or any particular game and look at if they will stand the test of time as a, as a company. Do they have the runway as far as financing is concerned? And do they are they making partnerships that uh, with IPs maybe because that still goes a long way? They're having relationships with brands that in the traditional space and artists or you know, music directors or, you know, the film industry, if we're talking about Gala, they're making the connections so much, uh, I guess, so deep and strong in, in a way that it it's a better bet, I guess. So the assets for Mirandas in this particular flagship game for Gala Games, mm -hmm. uh, it, it would, it would, it would be the best thing in their interest to follow up with all the things that they've promised as far as what the deeds will be and, and what would be, I guess, uh, what will be the game of Mirandas. Um, and, and if it, if, if it's time, if, if it's only time that they need, then, Hey, at this point, you're just going to take as much time as you're going to need to build out this game, uh, while everything else is happening. And we're going to be the ones who have purchased at a lower or medium or even expensive price. And we're going to, we're going to have to wait as a community. We could always put the pressure on any particular developer or, you know, gaming company uh, in this space more so than in a, tr in a traditional space. You'll be just be drowned out um, from the masses of people. Uh, but I think it's important to still um, support projects in the space as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not so much financially anymore, but more as uh, along the lines of education and security, and then 
you know, introduction to with free NFTs, just to play betas that you can earn and get this whole idea um, of how it works when you play and earn via, I guess, some particular skill that's involved, not just uh, you're here to make money and you could quit your day job right. and then live off of anything in the crypto web through space. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, especially when your projects like, I mean, even I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Mirandis will do. Uh, I, if they get the crafting right, and I hope they're like, I hope they broaden the way they interact with their community to get feedback and that they hire economists and they figure out how can we really dial in in a, a player run a, a economy that will be amazing just the same way star atlas it seems to be really committed to creating this virtual economy and so these are both massive experiments in in the works and i i i'm excited to see how they're going to pan out and that's why i'm here to be a part of it because it's it's really exciting if they if it for what it could become for sure yeah uh i, I think i can let me jump in here with the with the uh, my screen <laughs> i want to share uh, to your point, Jess, what Mirandis, and I know we're not we're not stuck on Mirandis. We're not going to throw any shade on it. We were just using it as an example because it is one of those uh, in the front of the lines as far as right. everything that they're trying to do relate, and it's involving Web three. They're building their own blockchain. They're, they're in film, music, project. right? So, so by far compared to any other project, a lot of projects are talking about making a comic book series or an anime series, or these are thoughts and maybe some plans behind the scenes that are working towards what Gala is doing publicly with marketing. Who knows what percentage of, uh, of progress they're at with any one of these things. They don't disclose any of that. There aren't any white papers or roadmaps and Gala doesn't believe in that. So we are only really speculating, but they're out here marketing pouring millions, double digit, you know, double digit millions. And who knows how much it, the number is now as far as the marketing is concerned. But uh, we have Yuga Labs, right? One of the largest uh, NFT projects, board at yacht clubs, um, where they had their, uh, what do you call it? Uh, their stress tests for the other side. Right. And wow. <laughs> and here we have the, uh, improbables. Uh, it's a, it's a third party company that's working with, um, uh, Yuga labs, right. And board of yacht, board ape yacht club to, uh, to have, this is what their game essentially is going to be. And this is a, a stress test. There was a lot of uh, talk uh, on the Twitter spaces of like, this is trash. Like this isn't nothing special, right? No matter what is given to people as far as the stress tests or development updates with the art and the actual avatars or how functionalities are going to work in the game. I, I, I don't know. It's probably never enough. You, you really become humbled in the, in web three space compared to you what know, traditional gamers. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jess. I was gonna say oh, that tall dude walking around there, a couple of them. What I want to see, yeah. what this reminds me of, and what I would love to see in this test right here is just somebody stand right here so we have the camera angle and everyone <laughs> go as far as they can away, and then everyone run at this at this camera angle, just like in that uh, yeah. the one shot in Ready Player One. <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. So this is the first thing I was gonna. I was, so some context before we get into uh, get into it, but this is a stress test, like I said, for the for the game of what the land gameplay and the, the ultimate game for Board, Board Ape Yacht Club is going to look like. And they are doing emote testing uh, in chat on the on the left-hand side. Let me full screen this maybe. And we have on the left-hand side a chat going, and then there's some directional. And shout out to Dave versus Axie. He's the gentleman on the bottom right. Uh, he's been in the space for a while, started with Axie, a, lot, a good, great content creator. Um, so there's our actual voice chat that's taking place. I don't know if you hear some chattering going on. So these two large avatars are the, I guess you'll say the the developers, let's call it. And these are the ones hosting the stress tests. So uh, if you watch any of these videos, I don't, I don't know if you can find them on YouTube, but he's on Twitch, Dave Versaxi. You can probably check him out. Top left, it's a disaster dot, uh, underscore ETH. And you could watch that there's different um, things that these developers asked of the people. So I think this is the second day, which was yesterday of the stress test. And uh, Max was around like 3,000 people at the top right of the screen. You see the amount of people in the server at any one yeah. time. And what one of the de developers would say is, all right, everyone spread out as far as you can, utilize all the space, and then everyone run to the middle, right? To see how nice. it's all it's all to stress ultimately um, and see what they can fix and, uh, and optimize to to make the game better. And then there's emotes, right? So there's the emote wheel that, okay, everyone, if you're happy, you know, click on the heart emote. So spam the emote, spam emotes, spam yeah. emotes, and then they would spam their voice. Turn they they uh, 
they turn on. So they're doing all these things uh, with all these people in there. And it just make, gets me thinking like, okay, all of these games that were around and being developed before, uh, before Board Ape Yacht Clubs was even an NFT, just art, right? It wasn't, it was just generative art. Uh, before any of this happened, what were the priorities of these uh, gaming companies or these web three companies or these developers with selling their NFTs to begin with. So I'm not thinking of just the, the, the floor price of any particular NFT who is now building a game on top of the NFTs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of what was the initial intention. And I cannot say in confidence because we're not even told these things. We're even told by Gala games that this isn't an investment. Don't think of it as an investment. And that's it. And if any talk of it will delete you, ban you. And and they don't say this outright. Some of the I think it has been talked about, but it just goes to show that there's a whole spectrum of intentions. And you see that with the actions. So you'll you know follow look at the actions, not what's being said. Right? It's important to hear what's being said and what's being talked about. But uh, I'm just I just love the idea of how it's going to be ready player one situations yeah. as far as the metaverse is concerned. And hopefully all of them are going to be that type of feel. And you just now choose the genre of game you want to play. But again, where are the, where are the priorities with any of these gaming companies? And if it is a flagship game for Gala Games with the MMO Mirandus, I would love to have it similar to this, right? They have talked about ha having, and they shared sh photos of 500 avatars on the screen at once, but it was only a still, uh, it was only a still clip. Or it, right. it was a it was a, a zooming out you know helicopter view of them all standing still. So ultimately, this is what's going to be required if we're going to have this new era of yeah. gaming come in. We're going to need all this stuff to be looking like this with thousands and thousands of of things happening on one screen at one time. So this is one yeah. of the best examples of a town hall slash test uh, stress test that I've seen, and it's it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And one other request I would have in this here is I would want to see a goal post and I want to see how far <laughs> they can punt some people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, yep. So apparently yeah, it was this is an old video. Uh, there's one 10,000 times more impressive. What's the requirements yeah. to join these tests? Well, I think you'd had, you had to have the, the NFT and then I guess, uh, register so i wasn't on top of what was going on as far as like board ape yacht clubs and um and i think what you're referring to was this first stress test the first stress test had which was the day before yesterday uh had the most people in it and that's what you know there was there was one uh by immutable not immutable i'm sorry improbable is the company and they've shared video of a of a different server i guess testing something out and there was way more people uh, I think that's what you might be talking about. If you go to their uh, Twitter page, they they were a company that's been doing this for a long time, and just now have they've uh, partnered with Board Ape Yacht Clubs to help them build out their their other side um, game. So I'm sure they've made greater milestones as far as what you, um, besides what you see here. Um, but but yeah, I I think it's great, and I want every game to be looking like that. <laughs> I want that experience to be um, similar. But uh, yeah, just uh, I'm uh, I'll hop it back over to you. I just wanted to make this uh, it was perfect for uh, to bring it up. Yeah, I mean, we were essentially talking about like you know NFTs and and blockchain and and the value of them and where the industry as a whole is going and you know businesses looking to participate. Um, and then we got you know we even got into talking about Gala. And one of the things that I was going to mention is that you know it's not just with Mirandus and the fact you know they sold a couple hundred million uh, NFTs just for that game. Um, you know, and, and before I leave that, that, the reason it's nice to be able to say we don't believe in white papers, but the truth is, is that the reason they did never drop a white paper on that is because at the time they didn't even know what they were going to do. So there was no way to create a white paper. And what we've seen develop since confirms and demonstrates that. But they also have NFTs for the music industry, and they're also going to have NFTs for film. So it's going to be interesting how they will find a price point for those for what the market will bear because i mean while i don't i'm not heavy into understanding what uh you know the the music nfts in the, in the film are going to be about but it, they are selling them for a pretty decent price you can buy the uh, uh, i guess one of the nodes that's related to music and then yeah. you can buy individual songs but for me it's still like i don't understand why i would want to do that because i don't necessarily understand what the earning model is to be able to spend that much money mm -hmm. on 
NFTs in the music space. So that's another thing that's kind of like, and it would be, I would almost feel better about it if that was their focus. But once you start saying, you know what, I'm in the music business now, I'm in the the movie business, you know, film, and I'm also in gaming, um, you're starting to spread yourself a little thin. And that's, that's a little concerning. Yeah. It's like you had five wives, like w- what one wife is going to think that you're going to give your all to them when you're having dinner, when you have all these other obligations. So (laughs) we need a roadmap. We need to have a conversation. There needs to be a dialogue. There needs to be information shared of where you stand and why and what you're doing. Uh, It's very important. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, I I guess we can. um, uh, uh, Did you have more, Jess, on your. um... I had just a couple more slides, I think one or two. And this was just another tech crunch article talking about how blockchain gaming unfazed by crypto volatility as gamers seek out entertainment. And so this is an interesting thing because the assumption is, is that the reason that we saw this massive decline in, in, you know, blockchain gaming, and there has been some, but it hasn't been to the scale that I think a lot of people think, uh, because as you know, Robbie Young of uh, Animoca here is saying that people have a tendency to couple crypto markets with blockchain games and content, but actually it's only as appropriate as linking tech stocks on NASDAQ with businesses of tech companies. There's a certain correlation, but it's not tenuous. And I, I, I would agree with that because it's not like blockchain projects where uh, all of the attention is only there as a result of what's happening, uh, momentum in the industry. Gaming and gamers are going to game regardless, and they do see the value in what blockchain can do for it, even if uh, you know uh, the prices of crypto are down. And so, um, yeah, I think it's nice to be able to see you know, others in the space that are saying, look, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're able to find evidence that suggests that, you know, uh, it is not fully coupled uh, to crypto. Um, and here we, we can see that in May, there were 1.15 million daily active uh, wallets interacting with blockchain games down about 5% from the previous month. Now, I'd love to see a chart over time just to see how this scales in its, in its relationship with the rest of, of crypto. Uh, but I could definitely see it having its own influences that allow it to somewhat uh, decouple. You know, it's not going to fully decouple because crypto is crypto and that's just you know the, how the market's going to roll. But I could still see the interest staying in there because think about it. If you and I find a good game, we're not going to play it less because of what the market's doing. If we're actually playing it because we get real value in the game and we get that entertainment value, we're still going to be there participating regardless of what the market does. Yep. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, <laughs> I, I just see... It's like a simultaneously you see where the future can be, you know, where we are now and then where we came from. And it's just like to, to, to think about all these things. It's great um, for, I guess, for us. But for people coming in, we always have to kind of ground ourselves and just think about put our, put our shoes in, um, put our feet in the shoes of people who are coming in. You know, as far as our audience, I think you know, we preach the choir often. And then I'm sure there's some things that we might talk about that even the, the individuals who are knowledgeable on what's going on like an article here an article there or even like a developing game that no one's interested in or they haven't heard of it's all valuable to anyone who's listening but i can only imagine like i was at at that point once uh just listening to a a a stream or a youtube video and there's so much words and things that i didn't know and i had to just hear them and research them enough to then get a get my footing on what's actually happening so it's been many years since then but um but if you are one of those individuals, just, you know, hang out with us, you know, subscribe, join the join the discord. You know, we have channels and individuals who will gladly answer any of your questions. And um, and and we are all learning as we are going as well. So don't feel like you're you're out there alone in the as a nomad in the metaverse. And if you are, we have a home for you. <laughs> so you can check out go um, just to plug plug in our guild here. Um, yeah, but. But, but yeah. just like every other bleeding edge industry, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> you might lose some money. You might make some money. But uh, keep your pants on. That's it. Yep. yep. You got something there, uh, Lumina, that you wanted to add? No, I just, I just, I, I just completely agree with you. I mean, this and when in this space, you know, I and probably a lot of people will agree with me, um, even though. It doesn't really matter how many years you spend on 
you know, in Forex or in Wall Street or in different markets, you know, SP 500, Dow Jones, especially in crypto space, I I feel like y- you can't really make money if you don't lose anything. I mean, people usually start with losing and then you, there's, there's definitely a learning curve. No matter what you know, there's always something. And, um, but, you know, we, you, and now the market is a bearish market. Who knows where's the dip? But um, if you we if you all believe that this if this is the future of finance and uh, industry is evolving and t- gearing towards this, uh, I think in the long run, uh, still this is still a really really small small market compared to you know Dow Jones. I mean, it's just uh, you know we're, all right, we just below one trillion and we just reached to you know two trillion. Uh, compared to you know forty five fifty trillion dollars markets, this is nothing. So yeah. we are still at the very early stages. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's just I'm going to breeze through these next couple of ones here. There's just another one pointing to how you know players don't need to be crypto experts to play Web three games, and I think that's what a lot of the de- developers now are trying to look to ways to kind of make it easy for onboarding. I know Star Atlas is definitely in that space where they're exploring partners and ways to. Uh, um, uh, to make it easy for people that aren't crypto savvy that want to use a credit card, buy a you know small ship and jump into the game. So uh, yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, you know, uh, companies and individuals and groups, and including the show, looking to educate people so that uh, you know their their comfort levels and their uh, level of awareness about the industry uh, makes it so that uh, it's a lot easier for them to begin to take part. Yeah, and and I think uh, if all else fails, we have Sam Bankman-Fried, who can, with his billions of dollars, as the Financial Post has said, um, he can basically save the whole space. Uh, so just wanted to just share this real quick. <laughs> I thought it was funny, but uh, it's also uh, pretty important that where is my stream? I had the stream. Thank you, Fancy. <laughs> or Jess. But yeah, crypto exchange FTX has a few billions to support the industry. So Sam Bankman Fried, head of one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges, FTX, has said that his company still has a few billions on hand to shore up struggling firms that could further destabilize the digital asset industry, but that the worst of the liquidation crunch has likely passed. Just to read the first paragraph there, or the first sentence. So, you know, it's, it's important to learn who these players are, uh, just as in the traditional space, as we know our Amazons and YouTubes, you know, the big fintech companies but then also above that we have governments you know so again preaching to the choir here but in this space of web3 there's a lot of hedge funds there's a lot of you know centralized entities uh that you should i guess uh learn about before ju- jumping in again uh to web3 gaming and then the same applies to web3 gaming it's a smaller niche of what crypto is to learn about who the big players are who are developing who have the money as far as these these uh, gaming companies who are going to st- last uh 10 years from now just based off the amount of money they made because they could always innovate and build on top of what they had which you might have thought in the beginning was a crap type of idea or a crappy game but you know there's a lot of money involved in a lot of investors uh money at stake and uh there's a lot of pressure on these shoulders of who are developing these games so it's all entertaining and you'll be following it all uh here if you just stay tuned with metaverse nomads another pitch so just wanted to share that Nice. The last one I had here um, is just, uh, you know, again, uh, Mutable X in the news um, and about how they're trying to approach uh, assisting with the onboarding of, of legacy gamers. A number of things that they're doing is looking to appeal to mainstream gamers by making uh, their wallet integrating with credit card payments, uh, free NFT minting, closing in on 28 million now, hmm. uh, building new games within hours. I don't know much about their platform for development. But um, they are uh, doing some pretty cool things. Like I didn't realize this, that they launched a $500 million, so a half a billion dollar developer and venture fund uh, to be able to support more projects uh, coming into the player and gaming space. So good on them. And uh, my experience with them has been limited to a couple of different projects. Um, And the, the one that we talk about on the show is Alluvium. Alluvium is definitely using them. And the the NFT launch that Alluvium did for land sales was on uh, Mutable X. And it was probably the smoothest, most uh, complex 
NFT sale that I've personally participated in because not only was it land it land sale, it was a Dutch auction and they had five different tiers. Plus they had a land map with seven different regions and all these different things that, uh, that made it so that it could have gone horribly wrong because there was so many variables, but it was incredibly smooth and there was essentially no uh, gas wars. Uh, it just like so many different things about it went incredibly well. So uh, that's my only experience with Immutable X, and it was a pleasant one. Yeah, they, they have some notable uh, um, games that either just recently, like Alluvium, jumped on board. Uh, like uh, uh, yeah, Gods Unchained is, a, is an old school one that we might know a card game. We have you know, Wag Me. If you go to their website, you see all these things, and it's pretty in depth you know ember swords just made the switch over as well because a lot mm -hmm. of these games are not developing their own blockchains to run on top of and are using just the the networks uh the, or the layer ones as that we know already like for example you know gala games is trying to build their own right uh axi infinity has already built one and they were one of the first to do so which was just i guess a task that is daunting and it's in it in itself to just do along with i guess developing a game uh and you have all these other games just looking to focus on building games, but then utilizing what the developers are doing as far as these layer ones are concerned. So we have Solana with Star Atlas, right? Uh, and and I think there's going to be healthy relationships with these existing, you know, layer ones. Immutable, Immutable X here is doing phenomenal. Um, and they kind of came out of nowhere um, right. and slowly built their name up to be a, a juggernaut of sorts in, in the space. So, um, and yeah, definitely keep your eye out. Uh, can I add something real quick to the Immutable yeah, of course. X? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually have some experience with Im Immutable X, and um, I've been trading on it for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this uh, app called, you, Ray, you might know this, uh, the VB app. They um, they have these NFTs, like licensed NFTs by, by Disney and Marvel and yep. all those companies. And they also have this sort of on their, on their roadmap and the white paper called a gamification. So all the NFTs are going to be somehow gamified. And now with the with they are changing the network and they are actually now switching to Immutable X, so people will be able to buy these NFTs on Immutable X. Uh, and I would assume they're going to work with Immutable X to to gamify their products. But the reason why I want to say this because uh, you know with these now layer twos, their upcoming layer twos, and they are a lot of potential uh, potential airdrops. This is not yep. a financial advice, but the, the word is out that Immutable X might have a token and they have their own layer two. You just need to swap Ethereum, like 0.2 Ethereum or something like that, back and forth at your uh, layer two. And who knows? You might get an airdrop. Not a financial advice, just so you know. That's all. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah cool. I thought they, are you talking about a new token that's coming out for Immutable X? Uh, yeah. They have their yeah. Token. Yeah, new token that they're coming out from Immutable X. Oh, okay. and, uh, you just need to, uh, if you're going to get, an, I mean, if they do an airdrop, if they do it, then you just need to do like a swap on their on their L2. Right, right. Yeah, because I, I, for, for Guild of Guardians, I, I uh, you know, created my account. I had m moved some money over and I was uh, pretty pretty active there for some time. But um, but yeah, right, right. That, there's so many things to take care of. I still have some ETH there, actually. For, uh, you reminded me. <laughs> so I might as well just... <laughs> move things around and test out whatever they're they're offering just because of a potential airdrop Absolutely. those those two those things too are becoming almost like uh uh having some bad associations with you know as far as like uh what not to do anymore right so but, but yeah. again if if it's a reputable company like immutable and what they're doing is is innovative and it's changing and helping around so i, I don't see an issue with it it's still a good way to to advertise and market yep 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 sweet thanks for sharing that yeah, absolutely. That's all I've got. Uh, their fancy hat. Is there, what have we we got? Anything else in uh, general news? Or we don't want to jump into one of the projects we always cover. Yeah, I squeezed yeah. in mine, so I guess we can just hop into uh, our the specific games. So, well, uh, if, you, if you got more, Ray, that's fine. If you've got other stuff, no, I was saying I squeezed them in as we were talking. Oh, okay. So, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, um, one of the big things to happen this week was uh, Athea coming out with uh, their Star Atlas firepower list, which are uh, very interesting, some of these calculations. I think it's important to like read out um, how they did it first. Right. 
So uh, in the economic report, like from the footnotes we mentioned last week, uh, the components are not line linearly additive. For example, two small class maneuvering thrusters do not equate to a medium maneuvering thruster. Uh, equates to about 73.5 of one medium. So based on that math and uh, everything we do know, uh, they gave each one a score and divided that by the VWAP to see what the actual like firepower is relative to all the other different ships. So, I mean, it's interesting, and I love to see you know uh, creative calculations for for how this comes up. Uh, and so, but it, it occurs to me that this is one of a number of factors that would need to be considered. For example, so you've got firepower, but then you also have um, shields and hull construction of, an, of another ship. So in other words, if you took those two ships and you put them head to head or two categories of ship, even if one had greater firepower, um, the whole strength of another ship is going to be a factor. Maneuverability of that ship as well is probably going to be an additional factor. So it'll be interesting to see um a category just like this for those other things for the hull and for maneuverability and also to see how those are weighted and of course we're reaching deep into the minds of, of what chipto and others on the dev team would would come up with for for algorithms for how those all would compare um, but immediately what are your thoughts about how you would use this information and it'd be great to have fun cracker on to, to kind of share his thoughts on how this was put together yeah so uh, one of the most interesting parts about this is uh, the Visus Ballard has actually sold out now. Uh, like this has been revealed, it's uh, quite high up there for what it has. Like that's a long yeah. list, even higher than uh, the Calico Guardian. But um, the so in there isn't any uh, numbers to associated so far with like bombing, uh, like things like ammunition so uh, it's very limited set of numbers but it does give us like a good reference if you so. could scroll back down to those bullet points you were just showing there was one there that i think is obviously going to be a big factor and that is turret gunners may play a role in how effective a weapon's hard point can be used but have no effect on raw firepower for now so yeah that'll be interesting i mean there's just going to be so many variables it's going to really be difficult to tell you know which variables when combined have the biggest factors mm -hmm. within gameplay. And I, I think this is a great foundation that, that they're setting for when mm -hmm. the actual numbers come out or the information comes out. So right. good on, good on uh, AFIA for doing this. And uh, I was reading in the foundation room or one chat in the, the official Star Atlas server, a conversation of the ballads um, having like one third. So if, if you wanted to split up a C11, right, you would get just four, you know, ballads because what would equate to the the firepower would total those four uh, to a c11 so instead of having a c11 stationed on the map if we're playing the actual game you can have you know, essentially uh, a third of you know or however the fractions are divided up if you want to call it a, a, you know um one uh yeah so you, you just have it split apart instead of compare it uh, with all the information that we have now. So nothing, this is all speculative at the end of the day. And uh, ultimately, we're going to have to wait uh, to know. And I wouldn't make or suggest anyone making financial decisions on information that we have now, uh, as far as what ships you would buy for any particular pur purpose uh, for gameplay. But um, you want to have, you know, in my opinion, a well-rounded fleet of things uh, as far as fighters and, and, and the like. So... Yeah, I agree. Like the Fimble Ecos Unibomber is uh, at two firepower. Uh, I assume that would be around 10, perhaps lower than the Calico Medtech, but that bomb will do a lot of damage. So, yeah, like, and also the Fimble Ecos Tree Arrow at the top, uh, that would definitely be more than the PIS 11, I reckon, all right, all right. when all the bombs and things have been added in. Yeah. The bombers have scored, scored quite well in general, though. I was surprised to see uh, the transports also having quite a lot of uh, firepower on them. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting how this is all going to change just based off of all the other things that you would incorporate into how strong, um, as far as firepower is concerned, any ship yeah. is compared to another. 
Yeah, it's, um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I love that the thought was put into this here, and I know I saw that uh, Sensei Yomura uh, commented there. Is this your handiwork? Uh, I know that uh, you're part of Alfeo over there. Is this something that Fun Cracker directly put together? Be curious to know uh, what was kind of like the catalyst for you guys creating this document. You were saying something, or Lumina? Um, no, I mean, I was going to say, um, I mean, you guys are right, but also, I mean, we don't really know a lot of the mechanics and not just that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in one of the intels that we heard that um, the uh, forming of fleets of multiple ships, uh, multiple ships is core to the screen, which means that will be uh, fleet formations. So and if you think about the roles of the ships, so I'm always making this reference to, you know, like a World of Warcraft game. There's like mm -hmm. a tank, there's a DPS, melee DPS, range DPS, and a support role. So, yes, I mean, weapon hardpoints and missile bays and turrets, these are all great in terms of what type of numbers they, they have given to them. However, if the fleet formation is important, uh, yes, visual spell might be great in terms of uh, firepower, but uh, you might need a sort of a, like, like a tanky ship in front when you have the fleet formation on screen because they uh, chipto said that the fleet formation is really crucial in screen so but when i think about fleet formation i'm not just thinking about having you know 10 of the same ships in a different formation i'm thinking about more of a sort of a tank support and you know range dps type of role but i mean i, I mean it's just a theory crafting but uh, I, I mean yes this might be right very accurate too but Without having the exact facts, uh, can't really, you know, make up my mind, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite, there's so many unknown variables, but um, the Calico Enforcer having like 100 more than the PSF4, I think that's quite impressive. Well, 80 more. Like just that massive gun at the front, that uh, makes it the highest ranked uh, medium. Isn't that insane that this medium ship has a capital weapon hard point? <laughs> it's just nuts. <laughs> it's like a ship strapped to this massive gun. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they're the next ones to uh, be bought up after this and the Visa Spallard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's the Enforcer that was also having a mosquito like body to it and right. on on, uh, on the rome's twitter account i guess we were tagged i forget by who now but they were someone said that uh, rome is fond and and likes these type of mosquito ships and i said uh, on the contrary my friend because uh we like cheese so well, we also like the ohm line or the <laughs> rainbow rainbow line cool so essentially yeah it was uh sensei yumura yumura who put this together and uh, the catalyst, of course, was the uh, uh, the economic report. So in, in essence, it was uh, him looking at the economic report and figuring out a way to use some of that data to theory craft or put together a model that gives us an idea of how they how they compare. So good on you for doing that. Much appreciated. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I believe uh, the missiles are just uh, it's assumed that they're twice as powerful as like a weapon. Uh, like a normal gun, so uh, yeah, that's something that could be uh, a bit off. Like there are loads of ships with uh, big missiles, but um, they are quite spread evenly across all the classes. I think it will be the like the drones that really throw off these numbers, quite frankly, because they can be like entire ships, like the whole tank. Right. So you guys think that when Scream comes out, is there going to be like a handbook um, that's going to give you an idea of of how some of the things work. Like, is this handbook going to say here are the twenty uh, uh, craftable or or harvestable resources? Um, you know, uh, things that kind of help us understand. You know, the, the value of things during gameplay, uh, the significance of uh, fleet sizes. Of course, we're going to know like how hangers will will scale and that sort of thing. But you think it's going to be like a little mini handbook? Or you think they're just going to be like, figure it out as you go. <laughs> I'm thinking that because we are in Web3 Gaming, any of this information that would be given to us would sway the market prices. So I'm thinking there would be a lot of experimentation needing to be done on part of the community or the existing community. 
uh, and then we'll have tools like this that share. But I don't think there's going to be any direct information. There should be a little tutorial, like with any game, right? There's a adventure tutorial that walks you through what's this and why you should think this is important. And but, but I don't think there's going to be any particular information that we're given. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't want it to be that easy either. And there was some conversation in the official Discord of Star Atlas also saying that to keep or the retention of users or new users, you don't want it to have you don't want it to be as complicated as maybe St Stellaris is when you start playing it as a new yeah. person. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just a lot of digest and a lot to go through on the screen, right. let alone just the definitions of things and all of the options that you have. So I think uh, with it being a little bit more um, easy to learn what's going on, uh, but then make it uh, a little bit more complicated and difficult as you play is the best route to take. Yeah. So you think there'll be any cutscenes or anything like that that they'll be adding to it, or do you think it'll be kind of like, uh, you know, like that little commercial uh, that they have in the very beginning of Starship Troopers? <laughs> I forget what that that line was they were saying when you see all the people showing up. I'm ready, or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so cool. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited to see if there are any videos or trailers that go along with, you know, we have the four four to six weeks that we're going to be covering, I guess, uh, soon. Um, but I'm interested to see what type of footage we'll get. Yeah, we could jump into it then. Yeah, uh, there isn't much information regarding this. We know it's on uh, the 21st and it's going to be a event. Uh, they're going to drop a module. They weren't very specific about which one. Uh, so, yeah. We're gonna have to uh, wait and see. Yeah, on the on the recent Twitter space with Ash and and community members uh, in Star Atlas, there was a lot of talk about why the jungle esque feel with the with the background with the fog and smoke. Is there something that's gonna be coming out of that? Right, it's, uh, we just don't know. And uh, at this point, with four to four to, to six weeks as the um, the marketing campaign, I just hope that what was talked about as far as what's gonna be released actually is released with you know at the six week mark because this is an actual timeline right this is this is something that was more or less promised to us and there was a list of things so you know more power to the team and hopefully they follow through with all of the things that they were uh listing that were going to be uh revealed on the 21st there's going to be a huge event so looking forward to it yeah what do you guys think about them leaning into the four to six meme uh, as people who have been around like waiting for the product and uh, that four to six week mark passing by. Yeah, what are your opinions? Well, uh, uh, there, I don't know if anyone wants to take it on. I'll, I'll say that it, depending on how long you've been in the game, you might not feel too good about it because the four to, four to six weeks was mentioned before and then there wasn't really follow through on whatever. Uh, so, so some people might associate four to six weeks with like, okay, I've been traumatized because we've been promised and it hasn't happened. But now there's a whole, I don't know how much more people have come into the community that have been new, but I, I don't see it as totally uh, a bad thing. It's something to rally the, the community around to look forward to something. And honestly, I don't think the team would push it this hard and adopt it as the meme of the community unless they knew they were going to actually release a, a good portion of what they're talking about within four to six weeks, because then it would make them just look even worse. Uh, depending on if you, again, were around for the initial, we're going to release something in four to six weeks and it, it didn't really happen that way. But, um, but yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Ray. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, Lumina, I believe you had a bit of news from uh, Coexist. Yeah, tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Giving the floor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, well, well. First of all, uh, for I mean, especially for the people, well, well, the Turks who are watching the stream, and also all the all the you know the people in the Muslim faith who are celebrating the sacrificial uh, festival, which is the Eid to say Happy Eid to all who are celebrating it. Uh, I gotta say, I have been eating a lot of a lot of kebabs in the last two days and a lot of baklava so i'm not feeling right. that great but um yeah it's a sort of a eating celebration in a way 
Uh, but before we get, get we get into the uh, the Craigslist, I would like to share a few things about the uh, the Bitcoin adoption. Now, I think this is really important because uh, there are a lot of Turkish investors, and this is this actually applies to all of the sort of the second and the and the third world uh, uh, countries. Yeah, not a lot of people might, I mean, probably know it by this time. Uh, especially with, with with the Turkey's inflation rate, it has hit its highest level in the like in the past I, th I think thirty years. Like the annual inflation is right now close to eighty percent in Turkey. Mm. It is crazy yeah. now. And uh, the, the, I think the Turkish Statistical Institute they just published the last month's figure. Just monthly increase was literally five percent. Wow. So it, it, yeah, I mean it's really crazy right now, but. I mean, there are several reasons why the inflation rate has risen to such an astronomical figure. I mean, there's including the increase in cost of energy and, you know, Russia, uh, Ukraine war and whatnot. And obviously the weakening of the Turkish theater. And there are some political reasons to which I'm not going to get into. But the other countries in the world are sort of, you know, facing a similar inflation rate spikes. I mean, the European Central Bank, they just said to increase the interest rate uh, for the first time in 11 years. Uh, so, I mean, this is definitely going on, but I think there's this cool thing happening right now, which I just checked some of the statistics right before, actually, I just I just came to the stream. Now, the Turks, they literally turn to a, a Bitcoin as an inflation hedge just nice. because of inflation now. Like, while the Turkish dollar has been weakening so much, the amount of BTC volume, especially on the, on the local uh, uh, Bitcoins in the region, has been growing considerably. Like BTC peer-to-peer -peer trading volumes in the first mm. quarter and the second quarter of 2022 have seen a massive increases compared to the fourth quarter of uh, 2021. Um, so I think this is uh, I think this is really important because you know no matter where the there's a crypto adoption, it just helps the entire crypto space to grow and uh, you know be more popular and uh, more adopted. Um, so I just wanted to share that with the Turkish audience and the entire, you know, metaverse nomads audience before we get into quite sure. stuff. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's important to take a step back, not just in within gaming, but as far as like countries and their economies as well. So it's great to have someone from a different country who keeps their ear to the ground there as right. their whole you know, family and background is and, and the population of their guild. No matter where you live, if you have a guild that appeals and specific to one region or one country, uh, then I think that it's just as important. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I think when I see the rest of the world and I see media sources in the U.S. that are criticizing other countries uh, that are diving into uh, Bitcoin more and more, I think that's just out of fear because uh, I think that there's the strong potential that those countries that are doing that are going to gain new levels of sovereignty that aren't tied to traditional world finance. I mean, we keep seeing... Uh, the U.S. media try and beat up El Salvador for their doubling down and buying another 80 Bitcoin within the last week as it dipped down to around 19. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, yeah. I, I think in the long run, that's the, the those stories that they're covering, trying to kind of like down talk it aren't going to age well. I think it's going to look good on the part of those countries that are saying, hey, we see the future in it. We're digging in. Yeah, I right. agree. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, where do you want to start with uh, Fancy? Which one should we? So first? I can just uh, bring up whichever you want to. Uh, well, uh, let's let's talk about the, uh, the the magazine. I know you guys are uh, looking forward to it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I love my magazines. <laughs> so um, we, uh, as, I mean, as you know, we, because the crypto space is sort of, you know, being bearish market and everything. Not all the discourse are are full now. At least they were. I mean, before. We had so many people, you know, theory crafting and strategizing and even playing games on Discord. But when the market kind of went down, the population kind of went down too. So we were like, hey, you know what? A lot of our players, uh, not just in our guild, but also in the entire startup community ecosystem, uh, they might not be up to date with their, with their faction and uh, the things that are going on. And uh, especially after, you know, winning the Copa event, which was really great experience for mm -hmm. us. Uh, we were like, well, maybe we should uh, do something about it and uh, keep the community up to date. I mean, we are having we are having a lot of different projects going on all at the same time. So this is one of them that we wanted to do it so much, but just we just didn't have have time to. 
Uh, so our goal was to create this little magazine called The Oni Times. And uh, so the, the, what I'm trying to do is to give some information about the uh, the Oni Guilds in Star Atlas and what they've been up to. And especially each month, we are going to introduce a different guild. So in the first issue, we're actually going to introduce the, uh, the Atlasio family. Um, also, each month, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, with with at, at least one of the members of Star Atlas team, uh, so we obviously we are starting with uh, Michael Wagner himself. So we did a little Q and A with him. He was nice. kind enough to send the answers. So uh, and we are planning to publish it fifteenth of each month. And then uh, we also have different type of gaming related articles. Uh, some of them might be related to terror crafting on uh, Scream. Uh, maybe new the staking mechanism, uh, descriptions of ships, and uh, and also different type of game modes. Too. And this is going to be completely free in a PDF format, and people will be able to you know uh, browse through it on the website too. So this is one of the initiatives that we're going to release each month. Uh, obviously, there we're going to have a we're going to have a section related to you know obviously a bit copa. Uh, right. We can't really, you know, skip that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that this is our our sort of a, you know, when we'll see, you know, in the future we might think about adding some news about the other other faction too. But for now, we're gonna stick with the Oni and Oni only. Uh, and then uh, who knows, you know, maybe Rome might be the next to introduce in in, in our magazine in the, the next month. So uh, that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be awesome to have a featured fe uh, feature in Rome. And I think what you're doing is phenomenal uh, as far as what it's going to require uh, everyone, uh, as, as far as like keeping people up to date in, in the factions. You know, for the, uh, as far as Mud and Ooster, I guess, you know, someone in their communities are going to have to pull up and take on that responsibility just because, you know, the game has started, as Wagner said many times before. And um, this is all strategic developments, uh, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah, the, it, the, one of the reasons I like this as well is that I envision a day if all of the, if the vision of Star Atlas unfolds as we all hope that it will, there will be a day when each of the factions have their own complete culture. There's going yep. to be uh, lots of opportunities for uh, media sources. You might even have someone that just has the mining news for what's going on in a particular faction or you know here's to today's recap of battles and so i love the idea of media sources being put together like what you're doing here with the oni times to really kind of keep people within the oni faction kind of up this up to speed on interesting happenings around oni yep yep so that's our goal um Another one is the um, we we, pro we teased it during the during the Copa event, uh, and I don't know if you guys had a chance to read it, but I personally read the Rome Guild's lore, which was great. Uh, but we also had our own lore, sort of a short lore, a few pages. But uh, we have a great, uh, actually, a professional writer who actually uh, two of his books were bestsellers in Turkey. So he was kind enough to write the coexian story so we call this project as the project messier initium so that's going to be the name of the book it's a novel about nice. coexians uh it's going to feature the sort of the era before the war and after the war so some of the parts the star atlas didn't even i don't know if they you know thought about that part of the lore but we already you know <laughs> thinking right. about it honestly and uh he already wrote uh three chapters so uh which is sort of crazy but um one of these days i'm going to talk to wagner and uh, see if you know he might be interested to maybe you know include some of the lore from coexians into the star atlas who knows so uh we um this is a long process obviously and uh and he's working really really hard on it uh but it will take few months obviously for him to finish this but it's really going to be a really great project and the thing is we kind of made it close to our own story and also close to the star atlas story too my only issue is i because I, I saw dominic out there um i might need to contact with star atlas because we are still debating if we are allowed to use 
the terms like Uster, Mud, and Oni, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, Fotoli, Sigmund, I mean, all those terms. Yeah. So I need, still need to check with them if you are allowed. If not, we're going to come up with our own. Hopefully, they allow us because, I mean, now it's, this is sort of a non -product project, but... You know what I, w w my guess is on that, and again, I'm obviously not speaking on behalf of, of Star Atlas, but my guess is, is that because this is built around so much community driven activity, and that is kind of what the future, the way that they've even mapped out governance to where eventually they will become a contracted developer for Star, Atl Star Atlas. Uh, it, it, I think that as long as you make it clear that what you have created is fan fiction and you state that somewhere, then, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't, there's probably not, in other words, you're not trying to represent that this is star Atlas's version of, of lore. It's mm -hmm. rather fan fiction. I, I think you'll probably be, be granted. Uh, yeah. Uh, free reign to do it. Yeah. yeah I seem I to agree. remember you mentioning a uh, book about like Eve stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Jesse. So yep. yeah, I guess there is precedent. There was a question in the comments for you, Lumina. If uh, you would open, if you'd be open to like working with Usta, so uh, like uh, each faction could have something similar. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's a nice proposition. Yeah, we should definitely. Uh, I'll definitely look into it. Yeah, absolutely. That might be cool. Yeah. 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 If, I, 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 uh, yeah I was gonna say for for each faction, there can be someone who contributes to the times, and uh, then it, it it could it could grow into every faction having some type of news being updated if the community members and then also for particular guilds if there's if there's anyone from rome you know shout out to winston for uh, really hunkering down and creating that um uh, that roman lore that we contribute that that he contributed to the guild and for the whole community as a whole um yeah if yeah. there's anyone out there who have those skills and have the time they can always for any particular guild i see that also being a thing where there'll be a a, a guild a guild segment or a portion of the of the times where there'll be updates just from what's happening within this particular guild yeah yeah i mean we uh and i gotta say when we when he started the because our own story is inspired by star atlas lore itself like we but we sort of implemented real world sort of um events into the star atlas's universe like according to us when the fotoli uh, visited earth uh there was this a uh, shepherd who was you know uh, dealing with his his ships up in the mountains of of mongolia and then he saw this sort of a light uh being in the sky so i mean that there's that type of uh you know fan fiction obviously but right. yeah i mean the entire thing is definitely inspired by the star atlas um uh, star atlas universe yeah nice all right was there another uh that we needed to cover well uh this is just a little update uh and i know a lot of the people are probably looking forward to this but we as you know we also are building uh, an Unreal Engine 5 game for the Star Atlas community. Right. So, uh, and then I got a quote from one of the one of the guilds in the United Metaverse Accords the other week. They were like, "Well, you guys want you guys want want the Copa, uh, and I thought you guys would stop, but no, we are not stopping. I mean, we uh, keep building and building. So, yes, the game is still being under develop. So, we just released a little a teaser video until uh, uh, so people can you know take. Um, uh, we with it's just a new additions to the Unreal Engine 5 game. Um, and I gotta say, hopefully, by sometime in fall, uh, we're going to have a multiplayer integration as well. So let's uh, let's watch it, Fancy. Yeah, I think uh, you may Is need sound? To no sound, so you're gonna have to share. Uh oh, my bad. I think I have YouTube muted for the stream. Oh, so you're going to have to share. Oh, my bad. I'll watch it there twice. You okay. And you can actually see... Um... Rome's logo on the right hand side when the character goes into the hunger. It's right it's over there. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So 
So this is the new addition to the nice. hangar, which again, inspired by the showroom itself. If you remember the showroom, there was a train station and sort of a space train. All right. Um, so we kind of added that. <laughs> Looking so good, man. No, yeah, that was it. Thanks. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and I, we also mentioned it in our last stream with you guys. Um, so first, we're going to have a Elyria based uh, FPS game inside this uh, this hangar module. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that train station, the uh, that train actually will go into the mountains, some unexplored places It's going to go underneath the ocean and then some other unexplored places and um, so that we can have this uh, sort of a organic environment uh, with the FPS game and then ultimately the uh, spaceship racing game. Yeah, very cool. Um, I put that fan-made game thing up there because last time there was someone who thought that was uh, the official showroom. Yeah, it's not. It's not, <laughs> it's not at all. Yeah. All right. Um, there are a few other things that, because um, I think uh, we um, we just had a a partnership with the, with the Harry Beats. Uh, it's a NFT market place that's coming out um, in the near future, in the in the very near near future. So these they they are trying to reach the global communities and. Um, we're going to try their ecosystem, so we assigned the partnership agreement with them. Uh, and when we wanted to create an NFT, they're going to open their market to us. Also, we're going to get some uh, whitelist and um, you know first-hand token sales from them. And and also when with this partnership, uh, on from all the sales that they're going to have, and from the from the income for total income. They're going to uh, distribute five percent of their uh, total income from all the sales in the marketplace to the wallet holders, cl close to uh, twenty thousand wallets. And we're going to have some of these wallets in our guild. So five percent of the sales, we're going to get them. So that's sort of a nice. partnership that we're going to get. And um, and then when there's a launchpad, we're going to test their launchpad, their products, and sort of do the a beta test and whatnot um so i'm almost like almost like a consultation plus you know a passive income type deal that we're going to do with them uh and also just last week we also got our actual uh name in terms of uh for the uh, treasury wallet address so now now we have our our own our own domain it's called coexist uh, dot guilt dot soul something like that so yeah, mm -hmm. so this is the uh, site that we got it from. It's a pretty cool, and I I actually knew about it before, but I honestly didn't really pay attention to it. But it's kind of nice to have a you know easy to read, just like you know instead of writing an IP address, having a URL. So it's the same deal, and it's pretty cool. Uh, so we're gonna use that. And, so, 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 um, before yeah. you go, and I got a question for you. Before you get too far, back when you were yeah, showing cool. that partnership there. Um, they were labeled as an NFT search engine. What is an NFT search engine? Well, they, they, they're going to build a marketplace. So they call it the NFT search engine, but okay. I don't think it's going to be like a Google thing because they're going to have their own marketplace. That's so they're uh, okay. So they're, they're a marketplace like some of the other current NFT. And will they exist on Solana? Is that are they a Solana based? Or are they a multi chain marketplace? It, it, I, I think it's Ethereum based, but I'm not 100% okay. sure because the people who did the partnership, uh, they were they were on top of it. I don't really have a lot of info on it. So, and so, I mean, is their model that they have their marketplace, but they're also going to look on chain to, to discover NFTs so that you could search for an NFT, even if it's not available for sale? Yeah. It seems yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, that's the idea. And like I said, it's the marketplace is not up, but I'm not hundred percent sure. But I think it's gonna, 
they're going to release it in a week or two. You didn't hear it from me, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, we're, you know, we're going to test it on our on our end too. So um, it's just started. I mean, I guess this and plus this is our first partnership agreement. So we are sort of learning this as we go along. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> And uh, finally, I don't know if you guys had a chance to. There's this uh, little, little uh, comic um, animation that Archetype uh, did uh, with Santi and Moontype and uh, Archetype. Uh, I don't know if you saw that animation, uh, but uh, it's about Star Atlas lore. And we are also uh, going to do a sort of a collaboration with them it, with their, uh, on their next episode. I probably I shouldn't say it right now, but it's upcoming. Uh, there's just so many projects that yeah. you know we're being all involved so yeah that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing all that because a lot of times there's communities who are i guess uh ingrained more so than or i guess guilds as far as like collaborating is concerned there's a lot of things going on in this space and thankfully that we have those brews and the, the twitter spaces with ash to, to to and it allows us to, for these platforms uh, it allows us these platforms to share all all of what's happening in the space for those out there who are thinking that the space is dead and there's no community uh rest assured star atlas has one of those strongest communities out there when it comes to games and with the playable game soon <laughs> so um, absolutely absolutely i completely agree and also not just that you know with all some of some of the fathers out there who didn't believe in the project and everything and even like uh, when we released the Unreal Engine 5 game and uh, there are so many content creators were shared it and they were like you know if a guild can make it just think about what star atlas can achieve uh, i mean this, this hope i mean we are fingers crossed this is going to be a really great project hopefully and uh i think we are really lucky to be the pioneers of this project indeed so, uh what else we got they released a couple of cool photos this week uh this is one of them uh i guess i can cycle through them this is uh yep. the showroom at the sunset Looks good. Yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, I assume we're just going to get these little uh, drops until uh, June twenty uh, first or whenever four to six is. So this was also a now. really nice picture. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. So not the next podcast, the one after. We'll have an update on that. I wonder how big this area is. Uh, that the showrooms within and if you can go out and explore and it'd be kind of cool if they threw some Easter eggs out there somewhere for just people to randomly find stuff hidden. Yeah, that would be awesome. Are they are going to put them graphic novels around the place that you'll be able to find. Yeah. Something other than that would be good. awesome. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they have to like test the concept first. If it works yeah. well, then you wouldn't want to put a big prize in something that's untested mm -hmm. so maybe, um also yeah sorry no i was gonna say maybe a little obstacle course race with little uh checkpoints that you can run through just so there can be like a mini leaderboard of just people able to run and maybe jump sprint i don't know what we're going to be able to do exactly but just for uh keep people in, inter entertained other than just the beauty of the landscape mm -hmm. and um this is a new series i guess of michael explaining uh, some of like the basic concepts of the metaverse uh, let's give it a go hmm. michael in the metaverse <laughs> term Web 2.0 companies, known as the social web. Web 2 companies emphasize user-generated content, ease of use, participatory culture, and interoperability for end users. While the creator economy totals $104.2 billion globally, the individuals who benefit from Web 2 platforms receive their checks through a centralized intermediary. That intermediary uses your eyeballs and sales of goods through its platforms to make billions from those drawn by user-generated content. And while your attention is captured, so too is your data. Fortunately, on the night of Halloween 2009, a solution began to sprout its wings. A treat for the global community of creators and users, and a trick for those who relied exclusively on closed, centralized systems to maintain their grip on power. That solution was blockchain, evolving into what is today known as Web3.
So yeah, that was a nice little series. We get to see uh, more of those. And uh, there wasn't much more released uh, Star Atlas this week, unless I missed anything that uh, I wanted to bruise or. Yeah, I haven't. I didn't see too much, but I think one of the things we could probably do next week uh, that we've done in the past is kind of do a quick scan over the past week or two of any good alpha, meaning any comments uh, from Buntheus, from Swagner, from uh, uh, Chipto, just anything that uh, might be newsworthy and worth sharing that anyone that's not in Foundation might have missed. But uh, it's probably a good week next week to catch up on some of those items again. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Is that it for Star Atlas? Looks like it. Cool. Um, we got we got some alluvium stuff, I believe. Yeah, we have a couple pieces. Uh, so they're releasing their alluvatars, and they have a video for that now. So yeah. That's the same one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind. Yeah, so uh, that was quite a good little update. Uh, it'll be fun to see what that is. I don't really understand what they are yet, but uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, and they had another one that was dropped, a little video clip that was dropped within uh, the Discord, and we can kind of talk over it because I'm not sure exactly fully what we're looking at, but it's something about their sharding system. And so this is like the little helper bot that seems to cruise around with your uh, with your avatar when you're out uh, hunting alluvials. And so I don't know here if it's capturing one or what it's doing to it, but uh, just a little tidbit of video that kind of shows some uh, uh, some gameplay. That's different from the battle arena, of course. <laughs> yeah, something we haven't seen before. Kind of looks like it's uh, catching him, but it's not like a complete animation. So. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Doesn't look happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, there was this thread on Twitter where Karen decided to uh, just roast any Web3 games that were tweeted at him and uh, to get some funny results. Uh, what he replied to Star Atlas is. I'll be going to grab some stock assets from the Unreal store so I can mock up something that will make crypto <laughs> boys believe E1 mine can be made in 12 months. <laughs> but you know what's funny about this is that you remember all the way back, even to the early beginnings of, of Alluvium, those guys have never even hesitated by, uh, to sling shade in every direction, <laughs> whether it was on Axie, whether it's on Star Atlas. Uh, they've had some pretty funny memes and, and quotes out there. So, <laughs> yeah, someone yeah. said uh, alluvium, and uh, he roasted himself. Anyone who's played TFT would uh, laugh at the state of alluvium right now, just because uh, it's so like packaged and refined. It's been uh, balanced like, in a major way, like six or seven times now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I enjoyed that thread, and uh, it is, uh, I'm not sure I approve of it really, but it got attention, so what can you say? Yep, I think that, I was just going to say that it was, hit the method to, there's a method to his madness. Um, sometimes, uh, who knows, you could get emotional, just spew out whatever he wants about any other project, but uh, the marketing of what they do seems to be that it's for a particular reason, and it's not just emotional spewage <laughs> of his opinions. Yeah. Yeah, someone said Mirandus, and uh, he said, once again, I played the original EverQuest. I'm a gamer. Your BS request to get me to play an MMO with lots of graphics is just not happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so he might not have like seen the recent play test but um yeah they are kind of stepping it up a bit but it is quite cartoony hey as long as they're gonna realistic environments right i was gonna say as long as they're ahead of any other gaming platform or company or group with as far as the, de the development of the game I guess he could talk shit as much as he wants because they actually have something playable that you can earn and that you can start, you know, I guess potentially earning from playing once it's out. So the game, the look and feel of the game obviously is a big factor for sure. However, I remember back going from, was it EverQuest that came out like right before World of Warcraft? And um, Ultima Online might be. What's that? Ultima Online? Oh. I think so it was Ultima Online. Online. Was Ultima Online was the first for sure, but I'm thinking there was. I'm thinking, okay, so there was Dark Ages of Camelot. There was um, uh, LOTR, Lord of the Rings. You had EverQuest, but and there was there was one other one other than Ultima Online because Ultima Online was still kind of a little bit blocky. And then I think it was EverQuest that came out that was a lot cleaner in look. So much so that when World of Warcraft came out it actually looked more cartoony than its predecessor. It actually had right. more of that uh, cartoon shaded color look as where with EverQuest, they tried to go a little bit more uh, of, of realism, more, more graphic power. And so, but yet, but look what World of Warcraft did. So I, I would think that if they could get the other mechanics right, people are going to be less concerned about the pixel blockiness if they can really get uh, uh, it structured. But as we've seen lately, it's a lot less blocky than they initially had anticipated. And again, I chalk that up to the fact that they're they're figuring out as they go and they just didn't have any idea at the time. Yeah, good points. Uh, so uh, I, really, I believe you have stuff for Axie today, Ray? Yeah. Uh, before getting into Axie, just a quick tidbits on um, Undead Blocks. Uh, so... Yeah, Undead Blocks, they have their inaugural um, 20,000 pistol speedrun tournament. So we did have Grant, who uh, who is the co-founder of the project, and uh, on a previous episode. So that's pretty cool. And we've seen a couple of Romans in our guild playing um, and sharing in the in the content uh, channel of our Discord. So it's something, you know, again, th these games have things that are going on that are out there. First person, first person zombie shooter. Um, the first of its kind in the Web3 space. So uh, again, you can always check out our, our interview that we have with Grant. I want to have channel. him back on. Um, yeah. I, just, I watched the interview that he did um, with I think with Dark that. Swoop of uh, MMA Gaming. I watched that yep. recently where he talked a bit more about the tokenomics. And I think what they're doing, uh, and by the way, thanks for for rounding him up and getting him on the show because what they're for doing sure. at Undead, Undead Blocks, I think is super smart. They're keeping it simple. They're making it accessible. They're not trying to overcomplicate the process. So it's going to appeal to uh, to gamers because it's not a big shift in behavior to be able to start entering into blockchain gaming. I think they're going about it in such a great way. And he's such a great guy. So I think we should definitely get him back on the show for some updates. Yeah, I'll reach out to him today and we'll see if he can hop on within uh, maybe not next week. Next week, we have a special guest on um, from the Twitter, from from Twitch, actually. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be exciting. Cool. But yeah, as far as like what they're doing with their tokenomics, I think it's it's innovative, but it almost makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and once we have Grant back on, unless you take it upon yourself as an individual, go check it out um, with their white paper and everything. I think it's, uh, it's one of those games that, in my opinion, will be around for a long while. Uh, they have first mover advantage for sure, as, as far as the genre of game. Uh, there's multiple first-person shooters, but they're doing it. They're doing it right. So, um, kudos to to Grant and the whole team there with Undead Blocks. And then also, I wanted to mention DeFi Kingdoms. It's been a kind of something that went under the table. Harmony had a bridge hack of 100 million. So this is a layer one Harmony, Harmony one, and their token one. And the DeFi Kingdoms was built on top of that. And they they recently moved over to their own chain, DeFi Kingdoms chain. That's what it's called, DF, DF, DFK chain, and it's on. It's uh, living on uh, uh, as a subnet on Avalanche. So since I guess the Harmony ha hack, which was which happened maybe like about a month ago, the, the the depreciation of assets overall terrible. DeFi Kingdoms kind of fell out of interest as far as like price, and that's why a lot of people were playing because you could make money. Um, but 
rest assured the team has enough money. And I've said it many times before, and they now everything is operational on the actual DFK chain, uh, which is a subnet on the Avalanche network. So uh, I'm still playing. Duels came out, so now you can duel with your actual heroes. And uh, as far as being lucrative as a project to start playing, that's not why I ever talk about any of these projects. But uh, as far as my own personal interests and then some of the, the Roman guilds, uh, citizens that might have also uh, had an interest. So that's why I personally talk about it. Um, but yeah, it's a great game, still fun, and it's continually being developed. They have the runway financially, and uh, the team is transparent, doxed. It's just like a great community there as well. So I can't speak highly enough of them outside of prices. So now going into Axie, there are, there's never a, a dull moment with Axie and it would be hard to believe that <laughs> if you just are uh, on the outside, on the sidelines of what was just the focus, which was the SLP uh, price and the economy um, with the scholarship craze that just fell uh, out of um, out of existence almost. There's been 60 plus percent of decreases in scholars with a lot of guilds and some of them shut, shut down outright completely because of not being profitable anymore. But again, that doesn't mean that the team or anyone... Uh, is not going to be able to continue playing the new V3 version of the game, uh, which is free to play, and you would only be able to earn, which is not online yet. Um, you'll be able to earn SLP and rewards, um, which is just SLP uh, in time. Right now, they just released, I think it was last week I covered some Axie Infinity news, um, and they have a season, the, the first season for the version three out and ready. And you can, you can earn AXS rewards if you place top 10,000. And um, let me here share my screen because just, just today there was a huge article that was released by Phil La, who is the, the head of the land development for the game itself. As you, as many know, and if you didn't, there's land plots associated with Axie Infinity and you can buy, sell, trade them um, with other people. And let me just share my screen. I haven't even gone through this article yet. And let's share this. Yeah, so this is a 43 minute read <laughs> that he compiled and it's in reaction to the it's title Axie Infinity Builders in a Bear Market, What the Media Misses, Addressing Misleading Narratives in the Media Around Axie Infinity. So for what it's worth, I would say it's a great read for anyone who is or was ever interested in Axie Infinity. It's a great uh, article to read to catch up with uh, what has been going on. And, or if you haven't been at all involved with Axie Infinity, it's a great place to start. Um, and I'm saying this, not reading it, but uh, just browsing over it myself as we were live today, it sums up a lot of what uh, uh, different topics of what uh, I guess people would be interested in. So it's very diverse and, in that, in that way. And who authored this, who, who wrote it? He's a director of um, land development. So he's been okay. hired from Pokemon Go. Uh, he was with Niantic and uh, he was been there for many years and then hopped over to Axie Infinity. And uh, he's been with, a, he's been, he's been with the team for a while now, uh, many months, almost half a year so far. It's been the mid, mid of, mid of last year. And um, yeah, I'd be interested to, I mean, I definitely want to peruse this article just to kind of get the take because something that keeps sticking in my head is the conversation that we had with our guest that's coming on next week, where he was mentioning that, you know, there are still some really big players, uh, Binance included, and then I uh, forget who the other big investor is, that are very, that are still very bullish on Axie to this day. And, and then that got me thinking like, okay, so if there are a number of big companies that are still bullish on the project, what are their considerations? What keeps mm -hmm. them so much so bullish still at this point? Because on the outside looking in, someone who who is upside down a, lot, a fair amount of money in Axie uh, kind of see the project from how my participation participation mm -hmm. would be in it as kind of like they had their day and they're done. But there's still people that have a lot of belief in it. I mean, you've obviously been a part of the community since the early days, so you have a fair amount of loyalty to it, which I think is great. But I don't have that same loyalty, and I look at it as I was in, didn't do so well, I'm out. The models change. Will they ever get that back? Can they rebuild? Can they have a comeback? I don't know, don't see it kind of thing. But I'm really curious to look through the lens of those that, from the landscape of investment, still look at Axie and say, 
now we see a future in it. So I, I'm really curious to learn more about why they have that perspective. Yeah. Um, like I said, it would be almost an hour's worth of information to go through. And maybe we can have a, a, a sit down with uh, Enjoy and Bayonar and even with a uh, Dark Soup from MMA. Maybe, maybe uh, I said, maybe on our podcast, but you know, MMA also just launched their own YouTube channel with uh, with covering of news and games that they're yeah. in, as a guild um, are involved in financially and just as far as uh, leisure purposes. So, um, by the way, yeah, that- but I did ping Dark Swoop about this because a couple of weeks ago I was saying, you know, I wanted to have a, an open conversation, almost even like a panel. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, the, the Axie team and, and folks would be very obviously biased towards that. But the panel I'd like to have is an, as non-biased as you can get, but also some people that have a vested interest. And the conversation is this. OK, we know what the old scholar model looks like, you know, and, and at, I think at its peak, you know, Dark Swoop was probably managing something like a thousand Axie scholars. Um, I don't know how that compares across the board with lots of others, but it's considerable enough to where you would have a, a picture of the landscape and how things evolved and how things change. And that's kind of what I mentioned to him, the conversation I'd like to have and also hear from them, like what they about it, what we think we learned as an industry from it. And what is the next iteration that will support developing countries where gameplay can be a win-win for both the people that own assets and those that they want to uh, run as scholars. And I think scholar is a weird name. I, I don't even know how it became to that name, uh, but to have people utilize your assets in a revenue share model. And of course, we know that Peg Axie kind of took that and, and, and leveled up certain aspects of it, not necessarily similar in gameplay, but they leveled up the relationship between scholars. Like for example, I didn't have to pay, go through and pay each of the scholars. It was already done at the point of renting it to them. So it'd be great to have a number of people on where we talk about like that. What, where, where is the whole model of scholars come from? What was good about it? What do we think the future holds in that space? Yeah, I think a panel like that, just uh, talking about Axie uh, would be great just for, uh, I guess, our own educational purposes for Absolutely. as a, as previous or current investors. But, but yeah, I've, I have been in the space for a long while as far starting out with Axie infinity and um, by far, just like with anything else, there needs to be an understanding of where not just the project was at its height in, in, in what I would say were many people's opinions, but um, till this day, they are, as far as numbers are concerned, really blowing out even open sea and magic Eden when it comes to daily active users. And the big discrepancy here when it comes to just anything number related with daily active users or just sales and uh, transactions uh, are just that because Ronin chain exists with its own, um, uh, it's its own entity as a chain that has all these transactions going going on and, and it's not being incorporated and updated as far as these platforms that are mainly or widespread, uh, they're used for keeping up with numbers as far as daily active users when it comes to games. So like blockchain game is a website, right? Dot com. And you mm-hmm. can see all games, but their information might not be up to date where it wouldn't place Axie Affinity uh, first uh, up on the list when it would be. And uh, I would like to share this here. This is an updated uh, or an ongoing update uh, doc for, uh, it's a Google doc that's shared uh, periodically, but it's available publicly. And here we are on, the far right hand side, uh, seven four as of uh, the fourth of this month, there's an update on the axle, and then on this far left hand side, you can see all the um, the information relevant to the numbers across the screen, and daily active users um, or axi holders, and all of the numbers are pretty much trending upwards, or relatively the same, uh, although we went down from daily active users to five hundred thousand, um, it's it's up. As, and it's been holding as far as the transition of players that were living and playing V2, which is the old version of the game, which is being sunsetted um, in September at the AxiCon Barcelona uh, event, which there's going to be probably a, a whole plethora of information coming out and releases. But, um, but yeah, th- there's just a lot going on as far as transitions uh, outside of just the initial, I mean, outside of the hack and then the ongoing bad um SLP economy conversations and criticisms that are happening on Twitter. But yeah, this is a a good place to look at for actual numbers when it comes to uh, anything actually related, not to get too deep into the weeds. Um, But 
just to move on with the updates here, there's the Axie Infinity Land Working Group. So the LWG was something that was created and headed by a community member with the support of the team for um, understanding how the plans that Sky Mavis has to evolve land. So here we have some bullet points here, educate, educating Sky Mavis on the history of land play uh, as perceived by long term uh, landowners. So there's a whole bunch of landowners who are still interested in wanting to help uh, in any way they can, just like we see in other projects and their community members. And uh, it's a whole document that could be found. And if you have land, you can participate in a survey uh, to give feedback because uh, it's open to the whole public, but it's something that should be um, checked out and looked through. And this might not appeal or mean anything to you per se, if, if you're out there, because you might not have land, right? And it might not mean anything. Um, but there's a lot of different, uh, I guess, limbs of this Axie Infinity Sky Mavis uh, game that uh, are being focused on, just like with Star Atlas and even Gala, uh, Gala Games. They have all these other things going on. And it's not to say that it's all, um, it's, not, it's, it's not to say that it's all not going to be focused on and developed, but over time, mm -hmm. there'll be a lot. Can, can you go uh, back to that spreadsheet real quick? Yeah, oh, sure. So you got daily active users, in-game battlers. Um, so they're basically looking at the end of March to the beginning of July. So that's roughly a three month. So a one quarter window is what you're looking at. So April, right. April, May, June um, from 1.4 million. But that's so that's daily active in-game battler. So that's gone down substantially. That's from 1.4 million to three. Yeah. To, to three, ultimately 300, 000. 350 plus thousand. Yeah, but that's not even it. It was even higher than that back in January of last year. So we have 2 million. So yeah, so the numbers have, this is undeniable that all numbers have gone down uh, specifically with X Infinity and its daily active users just because of the SLP debacle and the economy right. of how people weren't able to continue living just playing and, and farming, you know, SLP, which yeah. I don't know who ever thought that was going to be sustainable. And then we see Pegaxi taking after the model. Also, you know, Dane Arena, we see uh, just a lot of games that was riding the coattails of SLP and scholarship models fall and had the same faith. So, so for what it's worth, having this amount of daily active in-game battlers, which it is higher since um, the reporting of this, is by far more than any other game in the Web3 space. And I find it interesting. There was a tweet. We'll get back to that. But uh, <laughs> there was a tweet by a community member um, that goes by the name of Cloud White. And or Justin Taylor was a is a you know crypto Twitter. I don't know who he is, but he just wrote out some daily active users for each of the games that are currently out there. So we have Sandbox, Decentraland, Fort, Fortnite from both traditional and Web3 space. And then, you know, our hardcore Cloud White community member for Axie Infinity, uh, day one. So he was just mentioned Axie Infinity. Long story short, people are giving out numbers of uh, the daily active users looking like 40K from DAP Radar you know, uh, Dapper Radar. And like yeah. I was saying earlier, there's a lot of misinformation as far as numbers not being updated. And so g -Host basically jumps in and um, he's at church, but he gives the doc and the link to the doc that we were just looking at, the growth data. And Axie Infinity is for monthly on-chain users is 580K uh, compared to OpenSea and Magic Eden, which wasn't mentioned because these are games that the initial tweet was talking about. But as far as... Um, the on-chain users outside of the game, daily active users, is in the Web3 space is over 500,000. Uh, yeah. And then that's that's comparing to the actual marketplaces that everyone seems to think of and know of uh, to trade and transact and to sell or buy NFTs. And, and like I said, it is a marketplace on the Ronin network uh, where you can buy, sell, trade, Axie uh, assets, the, the items, um, and uh, also swap in between uh so, ethereum axs ronin and small love potion but when they say on chain users is that to suggest the number of people that have played and, and the reason i asked that is if oh. uh, like on that on that graph that you had the first yep. thing that i was looking at there was axi holders and then i saw that that dropped basically 10 percent in that quarter but then i started thinking about that that's not really a number that means anything and the reason it doesn't is because 
I'm still an Axie holder. Well, like, what am I going to do with them? They're commemorative to me now. So it's like one of those, yeah. I, I hold crypto kitties too, <laughs> but I haven't touched them right. in forever. So I don't know that holding, I think it's more of like, what is the activity? Um, so I wasn't sure what those numbers represented on that, on that, on that tweet um, yeah. versus the marketplace. Was that just people that have actually actively done something on chain right. users or like what are the, what qualified as an on chain user? Did they sell something? Did they buy something? Did they play with them? Correct. Right. Okay. So this is daily active users of in game is different than monthly or daily on chain users of the chain itself, which Got is it. the Ronin chain. And on Ronin right. chain for every block, there's transactions and that could vary from yeah. a trade, a buy, a sell, uh, a swap, a breed, um, a, a, sw a swap between a currency, not just between players. So there's just a lot of activity more so than on OpenSea and Magic Eden. And sure, it's a game, it. but it's, it, you know, so there's, there's all these things that could be nitpicked out. And I'm not here just axi maxiing this information. I'm just bringing it to the public for if they didn't know and they might want to check it out themselves to maybe dig deeper than what we're going to do here on this particular episode. But uh, yeah, these are just all the numbers that are just continually updated on this document. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you can see um, those numbers uh, for what it's for what it's worth and uh and yeah i say all this because the information is not accurate uh, uh across a lot of these platforms which keeps kind of actually you know below the surface of what's going on but all the while still hustling bustling and building out what they um what they intend to uh with the help of the community so right. and, and that leads me into the development update for july again another document you can just sift through to check out and keep up to date with what's going on uh, within the uh, the month, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna get too much into uh, here. I did talk a lot about what was going on last uh, episode, so if you're interested in Axie, well, maybe uh, like what is what is the thing you're most excited about, like for that on this document or like whatever is sure. like on the horizon for Axie. Okay, so land. Land is a big uh, thing that's being talked about. We have the land working group and uh, a lot of community members and land owners are taking part in helping shape uh, around what was already talked about as far as what land will look like. And we have some, some, um, some stills photos here of what land would actually uh, look like as far as what you'd be able to do. So we have idle combat. And uh, yeah, so I, I like this particular part where a majority, uh, a major focus of some sprints uh, over the, the next recent weeks is the idle combat system. So idle combat will provide players with a way to sell crafted items to NPCs, non-player characters. These NPCs loaded with these items will go out into the world uh, to battle enemies in combat. The system will allow players to compete with each other on a leaderboard. So the, the, play to, the uh, player versus environment, uh, adventure mode essentially, um, battle will also serve as a basis for more complex battle systems in the future and this is outside of the runes and charms that haven't gone online yet as far as crafting is concerned so right now you can you can craft runes and charms but it's not incorporated with slp which is going to be a huge factor um and and we have to remember how all of these uh different types of things once they go online will utilize small love potion uh mm -hmm. in a way that's going to have it burned and used and never come back as far as uh, when it comes to, uh when it comes to just playing the game all around and then outside of that we have those um so land is a big thing that i've been waiting for for a long while and uh it's good to see that there's more information you shared about it right we have some stills uh you, you're gonna have to you won't need to get off of the platform or the game You'll be able to have friends, right? So outside of the idle combat system, the team has also been building social functions such as friends and chat infrastructure uh, so that players will be able to communicate with others. And you can see we have come up with some fun ways to reward players for engaging socially in the game. This, uh, these benefits will reveal themselves with more play. Um, so again, a lot of rough draft, still photos, still nothing, uh, visuals, no visuals yet. We do have a land play video that did come out. I showed it. I guess a couple episodes back, but again, as as the team develops and the, a lot of uh, information is being shared, it's just you know a panel like you were saying, just and coverage of just specific axi information would go a long way to you know I guess have it all compiled in one place to to get people I guess understanding where axi is uh, right. in their development process and then um, yeah and then the builders program last but not least I did share last week there's 12 games that were 
uh, yeah, we are thrilled to partner with 12 inaugural project teams and supporting many other games uh, initiatives based on Axie Infinity. And this as well will incorporate the tokens. Uh, there's a certain uh, structure of how these games are uh, brought on to be so held. Are these games within the uh, existing Axie ecosystem or are these games that are coming on Ronin Chain? That are separate yeah these will live on the, these will live on ronin as games okay. Okay. and there's 12 different ones and each from a different genre and utilizing or having to utilize the tokens uh that are axs slp and then ronin um cool. and uh, yeah again this is outside just the actual arena play that you can take part in right now for ios and um uh and android and mm -hmm. the rewards are coming online soon and by far, you know, with the numbers that we know of uh, with Axie, outside of just those websites that aren't really up to date with what's going on, um, I just see good things in the future. So you've got LAN, so at some point you'll be able to show us some live LAN gameplay. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, yeah. LAN staking went live as well for all those who didn't know. And you can stake your LAN and earn rewards. And uh, there's a whole that's a whole other thing to get into. So it's just like a multifaceted type of um, development progress report that needs to take place uh, more in depth than just me doing a monthly or weekly uh, update, which is still good nonetheless. But last but not least, there's also a leaderboard. So the referral program went live and there's people who can make money off of the code that's used whenever you put in that code for the person. Uh, whether you know them or not, you can use a code and then those people get rewarded. Um, and these, this is the leaderboard. So we have uh, rewards in total since the, the referral program went live. I think it was just a month and a half ago not even and um so since really yeah, 1200 yeah. yep 12,706 marketplace transactions we have the leaderboards and uh i recognize a lot of names congratulations to everyone a lot of content creators or it's only been content creators who right. uh were able to apply anyone can but they're leaning more towards people who are producing and giving back value to the community to then be rewarded uh, as far as content creation entertainment or educational so um yeah, it's good to see all these things kind of moving along and just progressing and the information now being given to us as far as updates, photos, some videos, like this is what everyone always wanted and will continue to want from any one of these projects that we're talking about here. So it's important that these teams come around and start uh, start continue, start doing that or continuing doing that. So uh, cool. yeah, uh, that's it for me on the, on the Axie side of things. And yeah. Uh, I'll hang up my hat. Awesome. Thanks for that. For Cheers. sure. What have we got, Fancy? So, uh, yeah, that actually uh, Lumina did share with me a couple more Star Atlas things uh, that's quite relevant to the episode, so we could uh, cool. jump back to that before we finish. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, basically like a comparison of all the different types of ships. There's a couple of them. It's a clean graphic. And uh, yeah. Any thoughts, Lumina? Your mic is muted. Yeah. Um, again, this is one of the projects that I totally forgot about. Actually, if people visit our, our Twitter space, uh, Guild Coexist, we did a poster series called uh, Back to the Future of Star Atlas, uh, which is really fun. We're still doing it, but uh, not a lot of people know this, but I actually shared it with, with Fancy. What I did with the, the weapon hard points and giving points to firepower missile thing, we actually did a very similar thing back in, back in January, in December, actually. But at that time, we didn't really have a lot of info. Even still today, we, we don't. Uh, but at that time, we didn't really continue the project. We kind of keep it in our own and on the Discord. We didn't release it to the public because we were like, oh, this is a very secretive project, which it wasn't. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're kind of theory crafting and whatnot. But now, since APA did it, uh, and we would like to do something sort of a, a comparison uh, a poster series. So we're going to start this series prob probably tomorrow. And uh, each day we're going to compare uh different ships if in if they're capital being capital large legendary uh medium small so on so forth according to nice. their size firepower 
uh, maneuvering capabilities. And I think there is people are also mistaken, and this is sort of the same thing related to what I, with my example of being a tank and a melee uh, range and a support. So we're going to also compare them as being, if it's uh, like a defense ship or an offense ship. Uh, so that type of, of comparison of sort of, you know, a poster series is just, just coming out. Nice. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to be fun just to be able to um, go through these uh, on podcasts. As if you're a streamer or a content creator for Star Atlas, it's 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 things like this that really uh, engage the imagination uh, when it comes to uh, uh, these types of uh, games. And then uh, up until the game is actually playable, so we'll get more accurate information that could be um, could be shared with the public. Yep. Yep. I agree. Awesome. Thanks for sharing it. Anything else there, Fetch, yet? Uh, no, uh, I think we're ready to end. Awesome, awesome. Well, Lumina, man, we appreciate you being on. Uh, it's always good to have you here with us, for sure. And, uh, you, yeah, we're, we're excited to, to see uh, things grow with the, um, uh, with the, the Oni magazine that uh, you guys are putting together uh, to help keep everyone up to date on what's happening within the Oni faction. Um, yeah, and so... We had some stuff here to share with the Star Atlas, but we mostly covered news just around the industry because, again, it's kind of like uh, I personally like looking at the big picture of what's being developed and whether that's newsworthy content about new developers in the space, uh, about sentiment, market sentiment, uh, what's going to actually help be the best onboarding process by making it really easy for legacy gamers to come on board uh, because it's about gameplay and less and less about uh all of the different factors that make it crypto uh, the biggest the biggest hurdle getting beyond that. So uh, anyone that has thoughts and ideas that you'd like for us to be able to cover on future shows, by all means, share that with us. Uh, we love getting your feedback. And one of the things I like most personally about uh, when we do these shows is just how many comments we actually get from you guys sharing your thoughts and ideas. And and even when we, again, we're all here th uh, theory crafting together. So when we don't know something, it's good to have people uh, saying, hey, I happen to know this and be able to share that for everyone else. So much appreciated. Uh, any final words from you, Ray? Yeah, if uh, anyone of if you out there watching or even on the on the stream today know of anyone who wants to come up and be a guest to, to talk about a specific topic, yeah, you're more than welcome to. The, the, the floor is open uh, and we can always reach out to one of us in our in our Discord channels, uh, DMs. You can slide into the DMs. Um, but again, thank you, Lumina. If you want, you can uh, tell us where we can find you, your socials. And then if you want, you can also give a little message in Turkish. I know you, uh, I know there's a lot of followers who don't know Turkish, I mean English, uh, Turkish followers who don't uh, speak English. Uh, so by all means, but thanks again to everyone watching and supporting. You can follow us at gorome.io or uh, romeguild.com and uh, continue our, the conversation up in our Discord. So we look forward to seeing you there. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, and uh, Ray just, uh, fancy just shared it. Um, it, it. My Twitter space is Crypto Lumina and the uh, it's a guild coexist. And also, um, I, you, as you guys know by now, Rome has a special place in my heart. Uh, but uh, I'm going to save you from the debate of which ultra you guys are going to are going to play. So I have a little, 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 little surprise for you, but but don't judge me, all right? Okay. So, so here it is. At this minute, you were born. <laughs> Push the block and search of all. Now it's time that you were gone. So farewell, Atlas Miner. Yes. Farewell, Mud and Oni too. Just the sector the same to you. The pirate busters coming through. Farewell, Atlas Miner. Have a good day, guys. Thank you so much. Wow. Really appreciate this. Awesome. Amazing. Good stuff, man. Yes. Beautiful it's a tune, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. We it. do a we could we could do a live show one day and we'll all play an instrument and we'll just start singing the song. We'll take a different Sound line. Good. Hey, we might have a concert in, in Startless Metaverse. There you right. go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Lee. Awesome, everyone. We appreciate Thanks, you guys. joining us here. Uh, you know, smash all the buttons, do all the things. You know the places to find us. Go Rome.io, uh, RomeGuild.com. Uh, um, 
yeah, all the places, man. And with that, we're going to see you guys here, same channel, same time, next week, every Sunday. We've been doing this now. This was episode 50. But yeah. now we're well over a year of doing this because we had a couple prior to the rebranding. But yeah, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you here this time next week. Cheers. Adios. Atlas Miner, Atlas you Miner, were born, you were born. Push the block, push the block, and such and more. Now it's time, now it's time, you are gone. So farewell, Atlas Miner. And farewell, mud and pony too. Who's the sector same to you? The pirate bastards ran him through. So farewell. promised you a diamond mine But I'll be damned, it's hard to find I hope there's justice for their crimes and Farewell, Atlas Miner and Farewell, friend, don't take it hard Getting killed ain't all that bad They'll treat you well in the repair yard So farewell, Atlas Miner